aliens, extraterrestrials, ETs, A. Lamaus. A lot of names given to the mysterious potential figures that lurk amongst the cosmos. Hi. I'm Mez, and this is me talking about aliens. I've had a very loose interest in the topic of aliens, potential things that live amongst the stars that a lot of people say aren't real, but who the f*** knows? I don't know. But I want to talk about it today. I recently became aware of a book called Alien Interview, and I found it so interesting reading it that I wanted to make a whole video about it. So let's get into it. So the introduction to this book. The premise of this book is that during Roswell in 1947, where it's like the first government cover-up or whatever, apparently there was a woman who tagged along with the people that went to go retrieve the wreckage along with the bodies that were there. And this woman saw what was there. She said that there was wreckage and she said there was an individual there was multiple bodies most of them looked the same but one looked a little bit different and this one was alive the rest were dead the one that was alive was communicating with her and nobody else so the government was like hey you have to stick with this thing because you're the only one that can talk to it which led to a series of interviews where she was interviewing an alien and the alien was telling her everything like all these secrets about the fucking universe and it got made into a book. Now, how did it get made into a book? How the fuck does something like that happen? Huh? A gentleman named Lawrence R. Spencer got mailed these transcripts and was told to make it into a novel. And that's what this is here. So in this video, I'm going to talk about what this alien being said. So let's just dive right into it, right? Let's just jump into it. When I say I read this book, I fucking read this book. I like highlighted sections I thought were interesting. I have a bullet pointed list on this iPad. That's how much I read the book. So I think an important thing to cover first before we talk about exactly what the aliens said about the history and secrets of the universe, which I'm gonna get to, don't worry, is how did this guy get this information if it's true? Big asterisk, don't know if it's true. The guy, Mr. Spencer, doesn't know if it's true. Doesn't fucking know. Mr. Spencer over here is an author. He writes books. And he writes books. Let me just talk about him real quick. Check this shit out. Lawrence R. Spencer is the author of nine books. Nine. His books explore facts and fantasies of universes both physical and spiritual, including Western history, art, mythology, personal spiritual immortality, logic, and science fiction. A book he wrote, I think in like 1997, it's 1999, I fucked up, was called The Oz Factors, which apparently is like an allegory about the Wizard of Oz. I don't know, I didn't read the book, but to my understanding, he goes over some things in that book that are gone over in this book. While he was researching stuff for the Oz Factors, he came across this woman, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy. He doesn't say how, but he found her. Like what? So he found her, was asking her questions, and she was being a little cagey, right? Being kind of standoffish, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, obviously, she doesn't want to get shot by like a government agent. So she's kind of standoffish, doesn't want to say anything. And this is in 1997. It's 1998. I fucked up again. Oh, and this is a phone interview, by the way. He didn't actually find her. So once The Oz Factors is published, apparently Matilda O'Donnell McElroy read the book and was like, this fool kind of knows what he's talking about. So then she sent him all these transcripts and was like, make a book out of this so you don't get shot. And this is the book we have now. There's a lot of parts in this video where I'm just going to be reading the book verbatim because there's a lot of words. I can't do that thing where I like skim the page and then kind of give like a synopsis of what the page said. I'll probably do that sometimes, but there's a lot of shit here. Disclaimer, 
As far as the editor of the book, Alien Interview, is concerned, and for all practical purposes, the content of the book is a work of fiction. The editor makes no claim to the factuality of the content and, in fact, cannot prove that the alleged author actually ever existed. All the information, notes, and transcripts received by the editor are contained in their complete original form as represented in the book. The editor is no longer in possession of the original documents or copies of original documents from the author, i.e. Mrs. McElroy. Although the book discusses the origins of the universe in the time track of the physical universe, paranormal activities of immortal and or extraterrestrial beings, aliens, or gods, it is in no way the intention of the editor to represent, endorse, forward, or assume the viewpoint of the author. The notes and transcripts contained in the book are solely and only based on the representations and documents provided by the author. Personally, I am not assuming that anything I received from Miss McElroy is in any way authentic, with the exception of the envelope and the paper inside the envelope. I cannot substantiate any of it. Indeed, I can't truly verify that there was ever such a person as Miss McElroy other than a voice I heard on the phone in 1998. The voice could have been anyone. Personally, I do not have a vested interest in UFO research. Ladies? Yes, I've written a few books about immortal spiritual beings because I'm interested in the subject, but I haven't sold enough of those books to pay for the time it took to write them. It is a hobby. I earn my living as a small business consultant. What I may or may not think about any of this is irrelevant. Moreover, I have burned all of the original documents, including the envelope I received from Miss McElroy. Any proofs or attempts to authenticate the assertion that Miss McElroy actually interviewed an alien in 1947 will have to be done by others. What is true for you is true for you. Lawrence R. Spencer, editor. So essentially, my man, Mr. Spencer, is getting all heat off his back. He's like, in this book, contains some fucking weird shit. And I'm not telling you whether or not it's true. I'm not saying what I believe in. I'm not saying if I agree with it. It's just in this book. It's also really good writing to kind of be like, is this real? It's like reading a Star Wars novel and in the beginning of the book it's like, this might be real, I don't know. Mr. Spencer just being like, look, for all of you naysayers, I don't even care about UFOs. I don't give a fuck. I'm not the writer. Again, very clever way to kind of be like, is this real? <laughs> I don't know. So these interviews took place from July 8th to August 12th, 1947. And one of the first things that Miss McElroy finds out about these interviews is that the alien being is communicating with telepathy, essentially. She is putting thoughts, images into Matilda's head, and Matilda's like deciphering them based off empathetic feeling. That's how she describes it, that she just like does it based off feeling and what the images represent to her. The last big takeaways of this introductory chapter is that the alien says that its name is Errol. And while it doesn't have like a gender or any like physiological traits or sexual organs, Matilda says that Errol has a very female presence. And even Errol, the alien herself, says that if she were to put it into words that humans on Earth would comprehend, she is more of like a motherly figure and nurturer within her civilization. Speaking of her civilization, Errol says that she is a member of the civilization known as the Domain, which spans across like the whole universe, and that she is an officer, a pilot, and an engineer serving in the Domain, called the Domain Expeditionary Force. Post script. There were some things in the initial recording of the introduction that I failed to mention. I pretty much fucking nailed it, but there was a couple things I wanted to mention that I didn't mention. What I didn't mention was that the book, Alien Interview, was published in 2008. Another thing I forgot to mention was there are footnotes within the book that pretty much go over every key word that your normal, average, everyday individual would not know what it was. So for example, when I mention Roswell, there will be a footnote explaining what Roswell is. So the reader doesn't have to go like, what the fuck's that? And then they have to go research what the hell it is. Just as an example, everyone knows where Roswell is if you don't live under a fucking rock. But with that being said, a lot of the footnotes that Mr. Spencer provides to the reader, the source that he sources is Wikipedia, which is fine. I'm all about Wikipedia. When I was in school, I used Wikipedia all the time, even though they told you not to, but I did it anyway because... <laughs> I don't follow the rules. But keep in mind that nowadays, Wikipedia is monitored like 24 seven. So the chances of something being wrong are pretty rare because somebody is always there to fix it. But Wikipedia in 2008 may have been way less monitored. It was kind of like the wild west of information. But I just wanted to talk about those things 
in the introduction and I totally forgot to mention them. The main thing I wanted to mention was that the book was published in 2008. I don't want anybody thinking that this book is brand new and I'm just talking about it because it came out like last year or something. This book came out more than 10 years ago, almost 20 years ago at this point, post-script over. Let's actually get into like the interesting part. Fuck the introduction. Fuck talking about it. Now let's talk about it, all right? Chapter one, my first interview with the alien. One of the first things to note is that Matilda talks about what it's like being able to like communicate through thought. This is what she says. She says, I could not understand my ability to communicate with the being. I had never before that time experienced telepathic communication with anyone. The nonverbal communication I experienced was like the understanding you might have when a child or a dog is trying to get you to understand something, but much, much more direct and powerful. Even though there were no words spoken or signs made, the intention of the thoughts were unmistakable to me. I'm sure if you're actually psychic, you already know this, but I don't. Matilda says that she felt a bond with this alien being and that she didn't think that the creature was hiding anything from her or lying when she divulged information. However, since the alien is like a prisoner, you can't really be sure, right? I think from Matilda's perspective, it's like, oh, this weird thing is like talking to me. But you kind of also have to think of it from like Errol's perspective. Errol crashed on a random planet and got captured by people. And now they're asking her questions. So obviously being a, a thing smart enough to travel through space, they wouldn't just like a, you would think, would they immediately divulge all this information or are they just telling us shit just to give us answers so we leave Errol alone? Or she's like, this girl is not a government agent, not smart enough to understand what I'm saying. I'm just gonna tell her the craziest bullshit and she'll believe me. And then I can get the fuck out of here when they're not looking. It's kind of interesting. If this is fiction, I mean, it's claimed to be fiction, but if this is just from the brain of Mr. Spencer, I don't know if he thought about that. Did he think about that? He probably thought about that because that's really clever. I really like that a lot. Matilda goes on to describe the appearance, which is an appearance that we're all pretty familiar with if you don't live under a rock. This is what she says about the body. Her body was more like the body of a doll or robot. There were no internal organs as the body was not constructed of biological cells. It did have a kind of circuit system or electrical nervous system that ran throughout the body, but I could not understand how it worked. She dumb. In stature and appearance, the body was quite short and petite, about 40 inches tall. The head was disproportionately large relative to arms, legs, and torso, which were thin. There were three fingers on each of the two hands and feet, which were somewhat prehensile, which means they can, like, grip shit and stuff. So how my hand is gripping this microphone and how my foot is gripping your mom's boot. The head had no operational nose, mouth, or ears. I understood that a space officer does not need these as space has no atmosphere to conduct sound. Therefore, sound-related sensory organs are not built into the body. No one can hear you scream in space. There's no smells in space. Nobody wants to smell shit in a spacecraft. Someone farts in a spacecraft and you're smelling that for forever. It doesn't go anywhere. It just stuck with you. Matilda goes on to describe how it has very large eyes that were almost like lenses and they were black and opaque. So imagine like your typical gray alien. That's exactly what she is describing here, except in a lot of gray alien designs that we know of, there's like small slits for the nose, a small slit, a slit for the mouth. What that mouth do? Apparently nothing. And then Matilda goes on to describe how it has very smooth gray skin. So she's essentially describing what everybody knows to be a gray. If you've seen anything about aliens or extraterrestrial stuff, like I said, if you don't live under a rock, you know exactly what she's talking about. It kind of begs the question, all of the reportings that people have seen these aliens, are they real or are they not? I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real? or not. Diving into the interviews, finally. This is where the meat of the book takes place. So when the interviews start, the military brings in a whole bunch of people into the room, as you would expect, including like a whole squad. Like they have cameras and lights and shit. They have a stenographer and a language interpreter. But still, Matilda is the only one who can communicate with this being. 
This is the first interview conducted by Matilda McElroy on July 9th, 1947. Question, are you injured? Answer, no. Question, what medical assistance do you require? Answer, none. Question, do you need food or water or other sustenance? Answer, no. Question, do you have any special environmental needs such as air temperature, atmospheric chemical content, air pressure, or waste elimination? Answer, no, I am not a biological being. I don't eat, I don't sleep, I don't need oxygen, I don't go poopy. Shit's getting spicy, dude. Question. Does your body or spacecraft carry any germs or contamination that may be harmful to humans or other Earth life forms? Answer. No germs in space. Does your government know you are here? Answer. Not at this time. Are others of your kind going to come looking for you? Answer. Yes. What is the weapons capability of your people? Answer. Very destructive. <laughs> Matilda puts a note in, it says, I did not understand the exact nature of the kind of arms or weapons that they might have, but I did not feel that there was any malevolent intent in her reply, just a statement of fact. So she's pretty much like, my weapons will fuck you up. I'm not even threatening you, they just will. Question, why did your spacecraft crash? Answer, it was struck by an electrical discharge from the atmosphere which caused us to lose control. So she got struck by lightning. Why was your spacecraft in this area? Answer. Investigation of burning clouds, radiation, and explosions. So this is really interesting, right? Because it's a common belief amongst people who know anything or do like even the loosest research into this whole UFO thing that all of these sightings really started coming about after the testing of the atomic bomb. Yeah, so we set off a bomb, an atomic bomb, very powerful weapon, and aliens were like, yo, what the fuck's going on over there? Let's go see what's up. And then they got struck by fucking lightning. Question, how did your spacecraft fly? Answer, it is controlled through mind, response to thought commands. What planet are you from? Answer, the home slash birthplace world of the domain. And then Matilda goes on to specify, Since I am not an astronomer, I have no way of thinking in terms of stars, galaxies, or constellations, and directions to space. The impression I received was a planet in the center of a huge cluster of galaxies that is to her like home, or birthplace. The word domain is the closest word I can think of to describe her images and thoughts about where she is from. It could as easily be called the territory or the realm. However, I am sure that it was not just a planet or a solar system or a cluster of stars, but an enormous number of galaxies. Will your government send representatives to meet with our leaders? Answer, no. Question, what are your intentions concerning Earth? Answer, preserve slash protect property of the domain. So we're just property to these guys. Question, what have you learned about Earth, governments, and military installations? Answer, poor slash small, destroy planet. So essentially we suck and we're not threatening and we're almost going to destroy ourselves. Question, why haven't your people made your existence known to the people of Earth? Answer, watch slash observe no contact. Matilda makes a note that she got the idea that Errol is not allowed to make contact with us. So, you know, Errol, being a pilot, she works for others that are stronger than she is, I guess, or higher up. And Errol does not have permission to communicate with humans. Question. Have your people visited Earth previously? Answer. Periodic slash repeating observations. Question. How long have you known about Earth? Answer, long before humans. Question, what do you know about the history of civilization on Earth? Answer, small interest slash attention slash small time. Dude, she's ripping us apart. Question, can you describe your home world to us? Answer, place of civilization slash culture slash history. Large planet, wealth slash resources always. Order, power, knowledge slash wisdom. Two stars, three moons. Question, what is the state of development of your civilization? Answer. Ancient. Trillions of years. Always. Above all others. Plan. Schedule. Progress. Win. High goals slash ideas. Dude. Question. What type of society do you have? Answer. Order. Power. Future always. Control. Grow. Question. Are there other intelligent life forms beside yourself in the universe? Answer. Everywhere. We are greatest. Highest of all. And that's the end of the first interview. So some of the big takeaways are, again, I'm not gonna read every interview into the camera because that'll take way too fucking long and this isn't an audiobook, even though I should do an audiobook. But the first interview I thought was pretty important 
pretty concise, the answers are really short, and they're also very interesting. So some big takeaways from this are they visited us or they came to this planet because we launched an atomic bomb and they were like, what the fuck? What are these guys doing? That's crazy. And while they were investigating us, they got struck by lightning. We'll also find out that Errol is part of a civilization known as the Domain. The Domain owns the Earth. I don't know what that means. She just says that the Earth is property of the Domain, which, duh, if they're flying through fucking space, of course they're property of the Domain. I hate that fucking poster. It's a little bit eerie just sitting in a dark room talking to, into a microphone. They've known about Earth long before humans were on Earth. Their civilization has been around for trillions of years. Trillions of years. The universe is only thought to be 14.3 billion years old i think i'll put the google thing like right here because i don't remember exactly but w apparently we're way fucking off and we also find out that they have very destructive weapons after the interview the military gives matilda a list of questions to ask errol and they're like we're gonna go in the room with you because we need to make sure this is real because this is fucking crazy so when they go into the room errol doesn't speak to matilda <laughs> So nothing happens. There's essentially just staring at this lifeless thing, just being like, is it saying anything to you? And Matilda's like, oh, uh, no. Matilda knows that because she has seen this stuff, that she is like in danger. So her life will be changed forever. The government is gonna be like on her ass. The government might even try killing her so she doesn't say anything out loud that, of what she's seen. So Matilda potentially puts herself in this checkmate ass position of like, well, you can't do anything about me because I'm the only one that can communicate with this being. The military can't do anything to Matilda because she's the only one that can get the information. Whether or not it's real, Matilda could just be lying. Matilda could be sitting in a room with a lifeless doll just saying, oh, this is what she said. This is what she said. This is what she said. And it's all a lie. Just so the government doesn't threaten her life. It's all really clever. And I love this shit. Anyway, so that's the end of chapter one. Now, let's get into chapter two. The next couple chapters are incredibly short. So I'm just going to do it all in like one. So chapter two, we find out Errol's name is Errol. She tells Matilda that she's not identified by any gender. She's identified by her personality and people call her Errol. So essentially, they are way ahead of they are way ahead of us. They're way ahead of our time because this is in 1947 and she's already saying things that people are starting to say right now. Isn't that fucking crazy? <laughs> Errol also says the reason why she won't talk while others are in the room is because she can sense that the other military people have ulterior motives. And Matilda is pure. Or not pure, but Matilda doesn't like care about that shit. She's just like, I want to know what this thing has to say. That's why Errol won't talk to Matilda while others are in the room, because she doesn't want to talk to them. And because she's kind of in the driver's seat right now, she can just say whatever the fuck she wants. Because like, what are they going to do? They don't know how to kill her. They don't even know if they can kill her. If this fool can survive in space, she can probably survive anything else too. It's just a crazy situation, man. So the next couple interviews center around Matilda asks Errol if she can point out her planet to us. And Errol's like, I'm not gonna do that because that's stupid of me to do. I'm a prisoner, but also you fucking idiots don't have a star chart where my planet's at. So you will have, I, there's no way for me to show you. And also Matilda's like, is there any way for you to communicate with me that's not telepathic? Can you write stuff down? Can you like use any other form of communication? And then Errol's like, no, I can't do that. And Matilda gets the idea that Errol's probably lying about this. But, I mean, what are you going to do? She kind of just goes with it. So Matilda's like, well, what if we taught you how to read and write in English? And Errol's like, okay, what? So Matilda goes to the MPs and she's like, what if we taught her how to read English? I bet I would get better answers than what I'm giving you because you're obviously not happy. So the military's like, sure, you can teach her how to read. Uh then on, in chapter five, Matilda spends like three days just giving Errol all of these books, like 
every book you can think of. Those old things that taught school children how to read in like the 1800s that uh, apparently were pretty good readers. She gives her the encyclopedia. She gives her like fairy tales that are about American culture and values. Anything you can think of that is readily available just to grab and give to somebody to read, they give to Errol, which is fucking crazy. In retrospect, that's cool that she's able to like do all this shit. But in 1947, a being that you don't understand crash lands on earth and refuses to communicate with you. And then you teach her how to read English and you teach her about our civilization and you teach her about our customs and our culture, about how we make weapons and shit. You teach her all of this stuff. That's crazy. But it worked and Matilda's like, in three days she was able to communicate in English perfectly. Not verbally, she wasn't like talking in English, but when she was using telepathy, instead of using images, she was just using words that Matilda could understand. One interesting thing to note is that Matilda describes the reading process of Errol reading is that she kind of, she doesn't really read like we read, like our eyes don't skim the page and read the words. She's kind of scanning the pages with her special eyes and according to Errol she's sending the information to a different informant in the asteroid belt which is then sending information back to her of how to describe what she's saying in human terms and that's pretty much it so chapter six is where it gets juicy so let's dive right in to chapter six <laughs> So chapter six is where we get into the really big juicy bits. This is where it's like, cool, this person talked to an alien, allegedly, to where it's like, holy shit, like, what's real? I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real or not? This is the chapter where all of that starts. So one of the first things that caught my attention while reading this chapter is the fact that I said earlier that it's never really clear whether or not Errol is moving, but here it's specifically stated that when Errol finishes a book, she puts it down and then she grabs another one. So I guess she is moving. So I guess she's not just like this creepy lifeless doll that supposedly is telling somebody, I'm finished the book now, and then Matilda has to take the book out of her lap and then put a new one in it. Because that's how it seemed to me, but apparently Errol can move and pick up her own books. So that's good. She can pick shit up. I also said earlier that Errol can supposedly scan the books and she like takes the data and gives it to a space station or whatever. It's not really clear where she takes it, but there is a footnote here from Mr. Spencer. He also expresses his confusion and I will read it for you. This is what Mr. Spencer has to say about the scanning process in case you were curious about it, because I was also curious, so I tried finding out what they were talking about. The quote he's referring to says, I have now scanned all of the books and material you provided me. This has been processed through the computers of the space station in this region, translated into my own language, and replayed back to me. End quote. And then it says, Editor's note. Apparently, Errol is able to scan something she sees through the lenses of her doll body eyes, upload the data to a computer on the space station, have it processed and downloaded to her, or... Maybe she does it telepathically. It's not clarified anywhere in the transcripts or notes. Yeah, no one fucking knows what Matilda's talking about. So that's cool, in case you were curious about that. Okay, so now that we're done talking about how Errol can read a book, I can read a book. I can do that too. She puts it down, and then she goes, Okay, I'm ready to answer your questions now. Matilda's like, Okay, are you going to answer the questions from the gallery now? Because everybody from the fucking gallery wants to talk to you and ask you questions. And Errol, deadass, is like, no, I'm not going to do that, you fool. She says, no, I will not answer questions. I will provide information to you that I think will be beneficial to the well-being of the immortal spiritual beings and that will foster the survival of all the myriad life forms and the environment of Earth, as it is a part of my mission to ensure the preservation of Earth, because Earth is property of the domain who Errol works for. Errol begins teaching about the universe. Even though we didn't ask her, She's telling us anyway. So let's listen to what Errol has to say about the secrets of the universe. So one of the first weird things that Errol says that makes you go, uh? Errol mentions not having intimate contact with humans since about 5,965 BCE. And then she says, 
The last Earth language that she knew was ancient Sanskrit, and ancient Sanskrit is heavily used in what's called the Vedic hymns, which is apparently a series of poetic hymns that were essentially told to ancient people by the gods, supposedly, and they told them these hymns, and then these hymns have been carried out throughout humanity for thousands of years, and then eventually they were written down. But apparently these Vedic hymns are some of the oldest traditions in the world. So Errol's like, yeah, my people taught ancient humans about the Vedic hymns in Sanskrit. And that's the only language I really know from Earth. I don't know English. Because remember, English is relatively recent in the grand scheme of language on this planet. Errol also mentions that when she came here in 5965 BCE, she was looking for other fleet members of the domain that were apparently in a station built in the Himalaya mountains. What they did, apparently, is cut off the top of the mountain, hollow it out, create a space station there. Is it a space station? They created a base there where they were staying. And then they created a holographic projection of the top of the mountain so nobody would think anything was weird that a mountain was just cut off. And apparently these sightings of spacecraft flying through the sky is where you get those old mythological and epic stories from ancient Sanskrit. If you've seen anything about ancient aliens, you've probably heard this whole thing that, oh, like the ancient, the ancient civilizations in the Middle East had these stories of these great epics that were taking place in the sky with flying machines and explosions and it's all written down as like their Quran or something like that. And apparently those flying machines that were being reported in those ancient religious texts actually happened and this is what they were seeing, apparently. Again, all of this is so weird, but it's also so interesting and fun to talk about. I fucking love it. Is any of this real? I don't fucking know. Who the fuck am I? I'm just some guy on the internet. I have no fucking clue if any of this is real, but it's an interesting book, and I found it so interesting that I went out of my way to make a whole video about this shit to tell you this will change life. We are all immortal spiritual beings just waiting to get off this planet. Trust me. Oh, Errol also mentions this thing called the Old Empire, which she doesn't really go into detail here, and I'm not going to spout knowledge without having the page in front of me because, like I said, it's a lot. When I say that this book has words, all books have words. They're books, but this book has, like, words. Words that make you go, huh? So she mentions the old empire. She doesn't really say anything about it. She just name drops it by saying, I led my team to the discovery that there were still old empire ships and well-hidden old empire installations in this solar system of which we had been completely unaware. So she just name drops the old empire. She doesn't say anything about it until later. This next bullet point on my list and the next highlighted thing I want to read is where things get really spiritual. I am reading this verbatim because it's very confusing. This is what Errol says about living things in the universe. Personally, it is my conviction that all sentient beings are immortal spiritual beings. This includes human beings. For the sake of accuracy and simplicity, I will use a made-up word, isbe, spelled I-S-B-E. E is be because the primary nature of an immortal being is that they live in a timeless state of is and the only reason for their existence is that they decide to be no matter how lowly their station in a society every is be deserves the respect and treatment that i myself would like to receive from others each person on earth continues to be an is be whether they are aware of it or not essentially eros like everybody in the cosmos is a soul inhabiting an animated body, which a lot of spiritual, philosophical, religious beliefs already believe in. I'm no scholar on any of this shit. Like I said, I just find this interesting. I do loose research on this stuff, but I think like Buddhism heavily focuses on the spirit, general spirituality. If real, this essentially confirms some of those beliefs, partially. Errol claims this information will help humanity in some way. This next little tidbit of information that Errol gives, I think is very, this is all interesting. 
but some things she says are a little bit corroborated from real life. And remember, this takes place in 1947, a long ass time ago. So understandably, in 1947, where nobody is really privy to any of this type of thinking, Errol senses that Matilda is confused about what she's saying. And then this happens. Errol said that she sensed I was confused about the idea. She said she would demonstrate to me that I am also an immortal spiritual being. She said, quote, be above your body. Immediately, I realized that I was outside of my body, looking down from the ceiling at the top of my body's head. I was also able to see the room around me, including Errol's body sitting in the chair next to my own body. For a moment, I realized the simple but shocking reality that I am not a body. In that moment, a black veil lifted, and for the first time in my life, and for a very long time into the past, I realized that I am not my soul, but that I am me, a spiritual being. This was an unexplainable epiphany, but one that fills me with a joy and relief I cannot recall having experienced ever before. Essentially, what she's describing is astral projection, which I find incredibly interesting because not long ago, it was revealed that there is a CIA document talking all about astral projection and how it's fucking real, according to the CIA. Isn't that fucking crazy? So apparently, astral projection, something that some humans claim to be able to do, is real. And Errol and her people of the domain can do it too. And everybody is just a floating cloud spirit that you see in fucking anime. So essentially what Errol is explaining is, remember that episode of Pokemon when Ash goes into the haunted house and the chandelier falls on him and him and Pikachu fucking die? And then they hang out with Haunter and Gengar and Ghastly and just play around and jump on balls and possess other beings to scare Misty and Brock. You remember that? Also, if you've ever seen Yu Yu Hakusho, remember in the beginning when Yusuke dies and he uses his ghost to possess other people's bodies to like fight other people so he can get his body back? Remember all that shit? Apparently that is exactly what Errol is describing. Anime is real. We should all use our fucking ninjutsu to shoot fire out of our mouths and shit. Create atomic bombs. Errol restates that she's here because we're testing atomic bombs and the heavy radiation that it left in the clouds is very alarming to the domain because she's like, humans will destroy themselves because y'all are stupid as fuck. Errol goes on to explain how she flies her ship. She says that they fly their ship the same way they inhabit these synthetic doll bodies. She says that the bodies are linked up to the ship via that neural network that Matilda was describing a couple chapters ago. And what they do... Oh my god, this is the noisiest part of town. The way she describes it is they synchronize the body and the ship with the same frequency that the spirit or Isby gives off. So when the Isby possesses the ship, and body, they just fly it using their brain. There's no switches, there's no dials, there's no dongles, there's no bips, bobs, flippy dippy doo dahs. They just use their brain to pilot the ship. Which I'm pretty sure, um, if you've ever heard Bob Lazar talk about what it was like working at Area 51, he essentially, I think, describes that. I don't remember, I think he does, but I'm not gonna stop this video and then watch an interview with him and then come back. Just look it up. But I think he describes it as not having any buttons, that it's just like a chair in the middle of a flying saucer. Errol goes on to explain, again, she is a part of the Domain and she works for the Domain Expeditionary Force, who, as you would expect, fly around on these ships and go from planet to planet, protecting it, claiming territory, all that good stuff. She says that the Domain's main goal is to just expand throughout the whole universe um, and just take things over. Uh, they say they're malevolent. They say they're good. Uh, she compares doing that to the old European settlers. Um, we all know the story behind that. She says that unlike the European settlers, she's above all of that barbaric behavior. So I guess that's a good thing for us. We don't have to worry about them coming down. I mean, look, she's known about this planet for fucking thousands of years. If they were going to do anything like that, they would have already done it. They already own the Earth. Errol says that they are hidden from mankind until revealing themselves becomes beneficial. So apparently, Earth is not important to them. She pretty much says that Earth is 
too small and insignificant for them to give a shit about us. And the main reason why they're here is because celestial bodies like the moon, Mars, Venus, and the asteroid belt are good jumping off points for intergalactic travel. It's also Earth is on the way to the center of our galaxy. So Earth and the surrounding celestial bodies are essentially just a pit stop for them. And that's the only reason why they're here. Because she says Earth sucks. And what she says about Earth later on really sucks. Oh, I mentioned earlier that Errol really talks shit. She does it in such a matter-of-fact way. She's not like making fun of us and she's not really being rude. Just the way she says it because she knows she's right. It cuts pretty deep. This is the last sentence in the chapter. She says, The space station near the planet Earth is important only because it lay along a path of the domain expansion route toward the center of the Milky Way galaxy and beyond. Of course, everyone in the domain is aware of this, except for the people of Earth. So we just suck, dude. All right, gamers. Now it's time for chapter seven, the big kahuna. So much information is shared in this chapter that it kind of is really hard to follow. Chapter 7, A Lesson in Ancient History. So one of the first things talked about in this chapter is a personal note from Matilda saying that she's not really sure how to handle what Errol just told her, which makes a lot of sense. One thing I really want to hammer home in this video is that this interview supposedly was conducted in 1947. So Errol's talking to Matilda about space travel, astral projection, holograms, force fields, and all of this other crazy shit. And Matilda's just like, dude, we don't even have colored TV yet. This is fucking crazy. Nowadays, because of like television and comic books and anime, all of this shit is kind of like, yeah, whatever. I know what that is. I've heard that before in my anime. Fucking Naruto talks about force fields all the time. Come on. Android 17 in the Dragon Ball Z Budokai video games has force field as a goddamn special move. I know what that is. But Matilda's like, what the hell's Dragon Ball Z? Who's Android 17? One of the first things that Errol makes sure we understand is how time works. And it's very confusingly told. So I'm just going to read it from the book instead of trying to summarize it because I'm not going to make any sense. Before you can understand the subject of history, you must first understand the subject of time. Time is simply an arbitrary measurement of the motion of objects through space. Space is not linear. Space is determined by the point of view of an isby when viewing an object. The distance between an isby and the object being viewed is called space. Objects, or energy masses, in space do not necessarily move in a linear fashion. In this universe, objects tend to move randomly or in a curving or cyclical pattern, or as determined by agreed-upon rules. History is not only a linear record of events, as many authors of Earth history books imply, because it is not a string that can be stretched out and marked like a measuring tool. History is a subjective observation of the movement of objects through space, recorded from the point of view of a survivor rather than than those who succumbed. She's essentially saying what people say about history class is that the winner tells history. Events occur interactively and concurrently, just as the biological body has a heart that pumps blood while the lungs provide oxygen to the cells, which reproduce using energy from the sun and chemicals from plants, at the same time as the liver strains toxic wastes from the blood and eliminates them through the bladder and the bowels. Poopy. All of these interactions are concurrent and simultaneous. Although time runs consecutively, events do not happen in an independent linear stream. In order to understand the history or reality of the past, one must view all events as part of an interactive whole. Time can also be sensed as a vibration which is uniform throughout the entire physical universe. Errol explained that isbees have been around since before the beginning of the universe. The reason they are called immortal is because a spirit is not born and cannot die, but exists in a personally postulated perception of is, will be. She was careful to explain that not every spirit is the same. Each is completely unique in identity, power, awareness, and ability. So she's essentially saying that time is not a straight line like a lot of people think it is. Although nowadays it's 
very heavily talked about that time is like a circle that events happen at the same time that there is no past present or future everything is happening all at once people talk about that now but like i said this is 1947 so this is fucking crazy she also says that isbees there is like a hierarchy of some sort the way she describes it is there's just different levels of being an isby Errol states that all Isbees are unique. What makes her special as compared to Isbees on Earth is that she can leave her body at will, whenever she wants. Obviously, we can't do that. Some people claim to be able to do that, but whether or not that's real, no fucking clue. Whether or not this is real, no fucking clue. But Errol is saying that what makes her unique as a commander in the Domain Expeditionary Force is that she's able to leave her doll body whenever the hell she wants. She says she can see at selective depths through matter which i don't know what that means but i'm assuming it means she has like x-ray vision or something so like i said before they're in a room with a one-way mirror she can probably see through the mirror but she doesn't go on to explain what that means she says that her and other commanding officers in the domain can communicate telepathically which implies that not all isbees can do that i mean we can't do that or at least we're not aware that we can. It's explained later that humans don't know that we're immortal spiritual beings because of a very specific reason. Immortal spiritual beings or isbees that are not on Earth, that aren't in the Domain Expeditionary Force, can they also not... Can they also not communicate telepathically? It's unclear. I dropped my book and lost my place, so now I gotta find it again. Errol says that she's been around for trillions of of years and that our region of space has been around for nearly 200 trillion years that the universe as a whole has been around closer to four quadrillion years so according like i said before according to google if you look up how old is the universe we say 13.8 billion years old so it's possible we might be a little bit off on that number but who's to say i guess if we ever communicate with aliens they'll tell us According to Errol, the universe is an amalgamation of the imagined universes from various high-powered isbees, and that these separate imagined universes eventually came together and formed the universe that we know today. So Errol goes on to explain the power of the imagination of isbees. So it's like things exist because isbees determine that they exist. Before this, universes were illusionary and pretty much existed inside the imagination of N or a group of Isbees. Apparently, things like magic, sorcery, and mythology are us remembering those older imaginary universes. This is what Errol has to say about what I just said. It's a lot more concise. Before the formation of the physical universe, there was a vast period during which universes were not solid but wholly illusionary. You might say that the universe was a universe of magical illusions which were made to appear and vanish at the will of the magician. In every case, the magician was one or more isbees. Many isbees on Earth can still recall vague images from that period, tales of magic, sorcery, and enchantment. Fairy tales and mythology speak of such things, although in very crude terms. So, always talking down humans, we're fucking idiots, but that's essentially all these stories that we got about magic. They were old imaginary universes that we are imagining, that we are remembering. Errol says that the Domain has been surveying this region of space since it developed space travel nearly 80 trillion years ago. So, we have some catching up to do. Oh my God. Errol goes on to give some information about Earth from somebody who has seen it since it was born, essentially. She says, A review of changes in the complexion of Earth, Earth? Welcome to Earth. A review of changes in the complexion of Earth revealed that mountain ranges rise and fall, continents change location, the poles of the planet shift, ice caps come and go, oceans appear and disappear, rivers, valleys, and canyons change. In all cases, the matter is the same. It is always the same sand. Every form and substance is made of the same basic material, which never deteriorates. Errol says that the domain has been in the Milky Way galaxy for only 10,000 years, which sounds like only 10,000, but when you take into account that she's been around for like 8,000, 
thousand trillion years, 10,000 years is almost nothing. That's like you blink your eyes and 10,000 years goes by. I blink my eyes and it's already almost fucking 2024. So I kind of know what she means. I kind of know what she's talking about. I have some idea. So this is when Errol gives a little bit more information about the old empire instead of just fucking name dropping it. She said the reason why she came to this region of space, like the Milky Way, is they wanted to conquer the home planets of the old empire which was a central government of this galaxy. So they were like, this old empire, these bad people, these baddies, we got to get rid of them. So their main goal, once they developed space travel, was just to take these fools over. And apparently they won, but it took them a long time, they said. Errol goes on to explain that the planets that are controlled by, that were controlled by the old empire, because they fucking won, consisted mainly of planets that were in the constellation, the tail of the Big Dipper. I think we're all familiar with the Big Dipper. So it's cool to think that when we all look up at the stars and see the Big Dipper, go to the tail, the handle, and go, that's where the old empire used to be. What a throwback. Errol doesn't specify exactly where they are. Like I said before, it makes a lot of sense that somebody who is a prisoner will not reveal exactly where they live because she probably has seen human behavior and is like, I don't trust you fools. I don't trust you bitches. So this is where things get really sci-fi heavy. If you had a hard time wrapping your head around or even considering the idea that immortal spiritual beings are real, that astral projections real, that there is incredibly old intergalactic civilizations that have been here for trillions of years. If you have a hard time wrapping your head around that, then this isn't going to help you. This is where it gets like pretty strange. It's almost like a space opera let's just jump right into it this is chapter seven motherfuckers in 1914 a.d the archduke of austria which was a real person and assassinated which is mentioned here was taken over by an isby that worked for the domain how this works is because the isby for the domain was more powerful than the one already possessing the archduke i say that like <laughs> The Archduke is like a doll, just like Errol is. It's like if a domain officer were to possess me, he would kick my soul out of my body. I am me, and is I is, so I be. The is be would come in, kick me out of my body, take over my body. That's essentially what they did. The reason why they were doing this, according to Errol, is because they were trying to learn about the events happening on Earth. So he was in disguise as a human. And apparently, while inside the body of the Archduke is when he was assassinated. So this incredibly historical time involved ancient aliens. So when the Archduke was assassinated, this Isby from the domain was in his body. So when he was assassinated, the Isby was pushed out of the body. And then it hit an old amnesia force field that was put there by the old empire. What? I is be confused. From this event of the Isby from the domain being kicked out of the body and like pushed into space essentially, the domain finds out that there is quote an amnesia force field that controls all Isbys in this area of the galaxy, preventing them from leaving the area. What? I is be confused. Let's read exactly what happens here. So this is what Errol says about that thing I just said. She says, if any Isby attempts to penetrate the force screen, it captures them in a kind of electric net. The result is that the captured Isby is subjected to a very severe brainwashing treatment, which erases the memory of the Isby. This process uses a tremendous electrical shock, just like Earth psychiatrists use electric shock therapy, to erase the memory and personality of a patient and to make them more cooperative. The shock is intended to make it impossible for the Isby to remember who they are, where they come from, their knowledge or skills, their memory of the past, and ability to function as a spiritual entity. They are overwhelmed into becoming a mindless, robotic, non-entity. So when the body of the Isby dies, they depart from the body. They are detected by the force screen. They are captured and ordered by hypnotic command to return to the light. The idea of heaven and the afterlife are part of the hypnotic suggestion, a part of the treachery that makes the whole mechanism work. 
After the Isby has been shocked and hypnotized to erase the memory of the life just lived, the Isby is immediately commanded hypnotically to report back to Earth, as though they were on a secret mission to inhabit a new body. Each Isby is told that they have a special purpose for being on Earth, but, of course, there is no purpose for being in prison. At least, not for the prisoner. So, to sum up... <laughs> What the fuck Errol just said? Because like I said, this is where it gets weird. I wasn't fucking around. When somebody dies, their spirit leaves the body like a Dementor's kiss, if you will. And when they leave the body, they float up in the space like, oh, I'm going to go live a new life. See you later. This amnesia force screen detects the spirit, captures it in a net, and then blasts it with like, according to Errol, is a billion volts of electricity, which wipes the memory out entirely. So all memory of past lives, past experiences, everything that that spirit has ever experienced, it's all gone. Once that happens, the force screen says, now it's your secret mission to go back down to Earth and inhabit a new body. Essentially, turn all humans into mindless robots of the old empire. Errol will talk about in the future that there are past lives and Errol herself is like three trillion years old and she remembers everything she's ever experienced. That's why she can like fly a spacecraft. That's why she like knows all this information. That's why she's so smart because she's been alive for fucking ever and she remembers all her past lives. Like her spirit doesn't die. Like, like I said before, she just leaves the body, she does whatever the fuck she wants and just goes into a new body. Humans, you know, there's religions and beliefs that there are reincarnations, that we do have past lives, which I will get into in the future. But what this process does is erase the memory of all those past lives. So you essentially start new every time you die, which isn't normal, apparently. Apparently, that's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to like remember your past lives, just go into a new body that's made for you or whatever the fuck you want to do. But we can't do that. We're trapped on Earth. Earth is a prison planet which the old empire uses to dump undesirable isbees, which I will get into in a second. Oh, main takeaway from that whole thing, the Domain learned about this because of what happened to Archduke. They didn't know this was happening before. I guess the question could be stated like, well, why do you think that no humans on Earth ever remembered fucking anything? Why do you think humans on Earth are so fucking stupid? They weren't paying attention to what we were doing. They were just loosely monitoring us, making sure we didn't blow the planet up, and that's pretty much it. So it wasn't until something happened to one of their people that they learned all of this shit about Soul Lee's body gets captured, gets their memory wiped, and then gets sent back down to Earth to inhabit a new body without remembering any of the past lives. So they're essentially a mindless robot. They didn't know anything about that until it happened to their guy. The old empire sends Isbees that they don't like to Earth. If an Isby is uncooperative, doesn't listen to the government, thinks for themselves, or like does anything that the government doesn't want them to do, and they can't be like threatened into doing it, then the old empire sends them to Earth. Why do they get sent to Earth? I'll explain in a little bit. So Errol calls these Isbys that the old empire doesn't want undesirables. And undesirables are artists, painters, singers, musicians, writers, actors, and performers of any kind. Because of this, Earth has more artists than any other planet in the universe. So we got that going for us. So pretty cool. This list also includes inventors and geniuses in any field. Anybody who questions goes, well, why would I do that? Hmm? What's wrong with the old empire? They're sent to Earth because they're like, we don't fucking want you. Get the fuck out of here. Go to, go to this hellscape Earth and just piss off. So that's why we're all here because we're all free thinkers, man. Or the list goes on. Also, anyone who is like a sexual deviant, a pervert, a criminal, anyone who's a piece of shit, they also get sent here. So Earth is, like I said, a prison planet for anybody who doesn't follow the rules. And that goes for anybody. If you're like a cool guy, fuck the rules, man. I don't listen to what I'm told. Or if you're a bad guy, I just wanna, I just wanna murder. You're gonna be sent to Earth. And that's why Earth sucks. Errol says this about the undesirables of Earth. She says, The Domain has observed that since the old Empire space forces were destroyed, there is no one left to actively prevent other planetary systems from their own untouchable Isbees to Earth from all over this galaxy and from other galaxies nearby. Therefore, Earth has been a universal dumping ground for this entire region of space. Cool. Good for us. This, in part, 
explains the very unusual mix of races, cultures, languages, moral codes, religious and political influences among the Isby population on Earth. The number and variety of heterogeneous societies on Earth are extremely unusual on a normal planet. Most Sun Type 12 Class 7 planets are inhabited by only one humanoid body type or race, if any at all. In addition, most of the ancient civilizations of Earth and many of the events of Earth have been heavily influenced by the hidden hypnotic operation of the Old Empire base. So far, no one has figured out exactly where and how this operation is run or by whom because it is so heavily protected by screens and traps, Isby traps. Furthermore, there has been no operation undertaken to seek out, discover, and destroy the vast and ancient network of machinery that create the ISB-4 screens at this end of the galaxy. Until this has been done, we are not able to prevent or interrupt the electric shock operation, hypnosis, and remote thought control of the old Empire prison planet. The heavy mix of races on Earth? Apparently not normal. Apparently, Caucasians, African Americans, Asian cultures, etc. Each of these races have their own planets, but they're all undesirable. So their home planet takes their spirits and drops them here. That's why we're all so fucked up. Errol goes on to explain that unfortunately, they don't know where the source of the force screen is. And frankly, they're not really interested in finding it because they don't care. So this whole thing I just explained, this incredibly wild cycle I just explained is apparently still happening. So let's recap. Let me put this book down. Big takeaway of this chapter is everybody on earth doesn't fucking remember what the fuck they're doing. The reason why we don't know this information is because it's taken out of our brain on purpose because the old empire if it's real, wants us here because we're undesirable. Wear it with pride. But for people who have these thoughts, right? There are some people that are like, they'll meet somebody. Oh, I feel like I've known you my whole life. It feels like we were friends in a past life. It feels like I've been in this area before that I've never been in. Maybe in a past life, I was here. All of those thoughts, according to this, they're fucking real. So the reason why we don't remember is because when that past life died, all those memories were just fucking taken out of our brains and then put back in the body we are in now. It's all so interesting. It's all so fun to talk about. It's all so head scratching, brain moving, noodle waggling fun. And I love it. If this is real, cool. If this is fake, and just a work of fiction, some guy wrote it in a book and made it seem like it was an interview. If it's just some crazy guy or girl that read his old book and is trying to fuck with him, it's good. And I fucking love it. End of chapter seven. This was a long one. Holy shit, this is gonna be a nightmare to edit. So for chapter eight, a lesson in recent history starts off with a personal note from Miss Matilda. She says, the interview taught me a history lesson I will never read in any textbook written on Earth. The domain has a much different view of events than we do. What a polite way of saying, what the fuck is this thing talking about? Such a 1947 way of saying that, right? As the title suggests, it goes over more history, but it's more recent history. We're not talking about shit that happened three trillion years ago anymore. We're talking about shit that happened a couple thousand years ago. Once again, the fucking the loudest. So loud. One thing Errol states pretty early on is everything I just talked about with the old empire doing all this nefarious stuff, evil shit that the domain is trying to prevent. She says, since the old empire in this region was destroyed in 1150 AD, the domain has witnessed a resurgence in science and culture. So that's cool. So basically, all of that shit that the old empire was like feeding into our brains, making us hate each other and essentially making us really stupid. Um, once the old empire in this part of space was taken care of, humans started to remember a little bit more stuff. So the amnesia traps, once the uh, empire was gone, the old amnesia traps started to kind of dwindle in effectiveness. The ability to remember technology by many of the geniuses in the Isby population of Earth was partially restored. Sir Isaac Newton is one of the best examples of this. 
Hmm, name dropping. A cheeky name drop. In only a few decades, he single-handedly reinvented several major and fundamental scientific and mathematical disciplines. The men who remembered these sciences already knew them before they were sent to Earth. Ordinarily, no one would ever observe or discover as much about science and mathematics in a single lifetime, or even in a few hundred lifetimes. These subjects have taken civilizations billions and billions of years to create. Isbees on Earth have only just begun to remember small small fragments of all the technologies that exist throughout the universe. Theoretically, if the amnesia mechanisms being used against Earth could be broken entirely, Isbees would regain all of their memory. Unfortunately, similar advances have not been seen in the humanities as the Isbees of Earth continue to behave very badly toward each other. This behavior, however, is heavily influenced by the hypnotic commands given to each Isbee between lifetimes. So Isaac Newton, my old pal Isaac, getting some beers, throwing apples at each other. He is somebody who remembered calculus, apparently. According to Errol, no one fucking invents calculus in like a couple years. She says it took other Isbees billions and billions of years to figure calculus out. So my man Isaac, he's got a leg up on them, dude. Fucking got those experience points, leveled the fuck up. He put all of his points in mathematics, created calculus on Earth. Now that's what I'm talking about. Way to go, Isaac. Errol goes on to explain that what I said before about how there being so many different societies and civilizations and religions and races on this planet being weird. Apparently that was purposely done by the old empire to keep this planet incredibly hectic. So when they are sending undesirables to here, it's not like get the fuck out of here and go do whatever you want. It's a prison planet, so they're trying to make it suck. So they're doing this shit on purpose. Errol, to give an example of the old empire, she compares it to Hitler, which, um, remember, since this is 1947, Hitler just died. The war just ended because of the atomic bomb. But she states that the old empire can be compared to Hitler, except the old empire is way more brutal. So, um, that's a little bit frightening. Um... I'm glad they're gone. Errol goes on to re-explain. I think she does this thing, you know, she gives a very brief, not brief, she gives an umbrella statement about Isbees and shit like that and the prison planet and undesirables, and then she goes into more specifics. So she goes on to re-explain that Isbees are put on Earth because they dislike totalitarian governments by nature or because they were so, quote, psychotically vicious that they could not be controlled by the old empire. <laughs> Errol says that the earliest Isbees on Earth started in India and spread out to Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, Rome, and Europe eventually. Isbees are put on Earth in biological bodies by the old empire and given thoughts of civilization that were not derived from any other planet in an effort to keep the Isbees from remembering anything. So essentially what she's saying is all of the stuff that our ancient civilizations made, like pyramids and all of these monuments, people go to these things and they're like, what does this mean? And what was this made for? Why did they build this? Apparently, for no fucking reason. The old empire was telling them to build this shit because humans didn't know this, but the old empire is like, we don't want the people of this planet figuring out the truth of like spirituality and we want them to stay eternally miserable and fighting with each other. So we're gonna tell them to create these monuments that don't mean anything. There is no secret, there is no answer. The mystery is there purely because it's a mystery to keep us guessing. So we never figure out the truth to keep us always fighting and to keep us always miserable. So that's pretty fucked up. I mentioned very early on that the only other English language what? The only other language on Earth that Errol was familiar with was Old Sanskrit because, like I said before, the domain brought the Vedic hymns to Earth. Here, she explains why she did it. So the old empire, apparently, was feeding thoughts to humans to keep them battling each other, to fight over one god. Apparently, these are Errol's words, not mine. Apparently, the old empire brought priests to Earth to keep them, essentially mindless, obeying a god out of fear, and constantly fighting each other over the gods, or one god. The Domain brought the Vedic hymns to Earth to combat that. So the Vedic hymns go over a lot of like spirituality and being in tune with the spirit in oneself. So the Domain was like, let's just influence these people to fight the old empire. 
Because even though the Domain is like, we don't want to get involved with this shit, they still want to destroy the old empire. Since the old empire had like a stranglehold over us, the Domain wanted to take care of it. Errol's words, not mine, I swear. An important thing to note in this thing is that one of the proprietors of the Vedic Hems was a being called Vishnu. That's spelled V-I-S-H-N-U, which is an actual Hindu god. So apparently uh, that god was an Isbi that came to Earth to give humans um, the truth. Well, not the truth, to give humans uh, a different way of thinking. So I know all y'all people are very interested in what a Vedic hymn is. So luckily, my boy, Mr. Spencer, left a Vedic hymn in this book. So I'll read it for you. Here is one of the most famous hymns from the Rig Veda, which is one of the most popular Vedic hymns, the Hymn of Creation. A time is envisioned when the world was not only a watery chaos and a warm cosmic breath which could give an impetus of life. Notice how thought gives rise to desire, and desire links non-being to being. Yet the whole process is shrouded in mystery. Where do the gods fit in this creation scheme? The non-existent was not. The existent was not at the time. The atmosphere was not, nor the heavens which are beyond. What was concealed? Where? In whose protection? Was it water? An unfathomable abyss? There was neither death nor immortality then. There was not distinction of day or night. That alone breathed the windless by its own power. Other than that, there was not anything else. Darkness was hidden by darkness in the beginning. All this was an indistinguishable sea, that which becomes, that which was enveloped by the void, that alone was born through the power of heat. Upon that desire arose in the beginning. There was the first discharge of thought. Sages discovered this link of the existent to the non-existent. Having searched in the heart with wisdom, their line was extended across. What was below, what was above, there were impregnators, there were powers, inherent power below, impulses above. Who knows truly, who here will declare whence it arose, whence this creation? The gods are subsequent to the creation of this, who? then knows whence this creation has come into being, whether it was made or not. He in the highest heaven is its savior. Surely he knows, or perhaps he knows not. I don't know what that means, but it's there. Here is a, uh, a little thing that Errol said. She talks about the history of religion on Earth. A battle was waged between the old empire forces and the domain through religious conquest. Between 1500 BCE and about 1200 BCE, the domain forces attempted to teach the concept of an individual immortal spiritual being to several influential beings on Earth. One such instance resulted in a very tragic misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and misapplication of the concept. The idea was perverted and applied to mean that there is only one Isbi, instead of the truth that everyone is an Isbi. Obviously, this was a gross incomprehension and an utter unwillingness to take responsibility for one's own power. The old empire priests managed to corrupt the concept of individual immortality into the idea that there is only one all-powerful Isbi, and that no one else is or is allowed to be in Isbi. Obviously, this is the work of the old empire amnesia operation. Obviously, you fucking idiot. So Errol pretty much admits that the domain tried to come down and teach us about immortal spiritual beings, but because we're stupid, we um, completely fucked it up and made everything worse. So good for us. Moses, my man Moses, you know, he's the guy that split that sea with that Beyblade, you remember that shit? He's brought up as a proprietor of the One God idea, which again, the Domain doesn't like, but I don't think Moses was a bad guy. Let's talk about what Errol says about my man Moses. When Moses went to Mount Sinai, where he found the Ten Commandments, and claimed to have seen God, who told him and gave him the Ten Commandments, it was actually an old empire Isbi that was tricking Moses into thinking that he was a God, an almighty being. To achieve this, Errol says they used aesthetic traps, which she doesn't go into details about what an aesthetic trap is. I'm assuming if on Easter, if you've ever been at a family dinner on Easter and they're playing the Moses movie, The Ten Commandments, and he gets to the top of the building, 
what? He gets to the top of the mountain and it's like a tornado and God talking to him. I think that's what that is. So they used like lightning and shit. They made it really spooky. It's like, I'm a God. Kaboom. Kaboom. Listen to me. I'm God. Look, I can control lightning and shit. So I'm assuming that's what that is. Errol does not explain what an aesthetic trap is or what they used. I would love to know. So this means that, you know, if you read the Bible, which I've never read, but there's videos about it, so you can watch it. So essentially what this means is that what Moses and everybody else used to call Yahweh is actually an old empire Isbi that was just tricking them into being subservient some more. Essentially, the old empire Isbi was like, I'm going to give these people a shit ton of rules. Well, 10. 10 rules to follow and you better not question it and if you do you will be forever damned or whatever apparently that was all a trick and they fell for it obviously they fell for it why the fuck would you question that that is so scary <laughs> This is what Errol has to say about Moses. The name Yahweh means anonymous, as the Isbis who worked with Moses could not use an actual name or anything that would identify himself or blow the cover of the amnesia prison operation. The last thing the covert amnesia hypnosis prison system wants to do is reveal themselves openly to the Isbis on Earth. They feel that this would restore the inmates' memories. This is the reason that all traces of physical encounters between operatives of space civilizations and humans is very carefully hidden disguised, covered up, denied, or misdirected. This old empire operative contacted Moses on a desert mountaintop and delivered the 10 hypnotic commands to him. These commands are very forcefully worded and compel an Isby into utter subservience to the will of the operator. These hypnotic commands are still in effect and influence the thought patterns of millions of Isbys thousands of years later. Incidentally, we later discovered that the so-called Yahweh also wrote, programmed, and encoded the text of the Torah Huh? Which, when it's read literally, or in its decoded form, will provide a great deal more false information to those who read it. What? So she's also talking smack on the Torah. So all my Jewish boys, apparently you're being brainwashed. Her words, not mine. It's in the book. I'm reading the book. I don't have any opinion on this shit. It's just fascinating. Errol goes on to explain what it's like for other Isbees to come to Earth who are not brainwashed. She says this, You asked me earlier why the Domain and other space civilizations do not land on Earth or make their presence known. Land on Earth? Do you think we are crazy or want to be crazy? It takes a very brave Isby to come through the atmosphere and land on Earth, because this is a prison planet with a very uncontrolled, psychotic population. And no Isby is entirely proof against the risk of entrapment as with the members of the Domain Expeditionary Force who were captured in the Himalayas 8,200 years ago. So she's like, why the fuck would we come here? This place is fucking crazy. She also talks more shit on our planet. She says, no one knows what Isbees on Earth are going to do. We are not scheduled to invest the resources of the Domain to take total control of all the space surrounding the area at this time. This will occur in the not-too-distant future, about 5,000 Earth years. So we'll all be dead by then according to the time schedule of the domain. At this time, we do not prevent transports from other planetary systems or galaxies from continuing to drop Isbees into the Amnesia 4 screen area. Eventually, this will change. In addition, Earth inherently is a highly unstable planet, I know. It is not suitable for settlement or permanent habitation for any sustainable civilization. Oops! This is part of the reason why it is being used as a prison planet. No one else would seriously consider living here for a variety of simple and compelling reasons. Cool. So our planet sucks. Here are the reasons in case you are wondering. The continental land masses of Earth are floating on a sea of molten lava beneath the surface, which causes the land masses to crack, crumble, and shift continually. Because of the liquid nature of the core, the planet is largely volcanic and subject to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The magnetic poles of the planet shift radically about once every 20,000 years. This causes a greater or lesser degree of devastation as a result of the tidal waves and climactic changes. Earth is very distant from the center of the galaxy. So those are essentially the reasons why they don't come here. Earth is a prison planet for a reason. It fucking sucks and nobody wants to be here. The surface is too volatile to live here. It literally says that no civilization can live here. But we're making a pretty good job of it, right? We're destroying it, kind of. Um, the planet's falling apart, but we're making do. I mean... We got Bloodborne, right? This kind of makes me feel a little bit better. This whole time, it seems like Earth has been the sole target for all of this shit. Of all the planets in the world, it's like, why is Earth 
the prison planet. Why do spiritual beings on Earth get their memory wiped out? How come we can't do all this cool shit? But Errol states that this whole amnesia thing, this trap, it's a common thing. So the old empire has used this uh, process on many other planets, apparently, in the galaxy, which makes me feel a little bit better. Um, and again, the reason why they didn't know they were doing it to Earth is because it's invisible. They can't see it, really. Um, and they only found out about it because one of their buddies got fucking assassinated and then suffered the amnesia trap thing. I'm going to end this chapter on probably the most savage thing Errol ever says. If the Domain sent ships to every corner of the universe in search of hell, their quest could end on Earth. What greater brutality can be inflicted on anyone than to erase the spiritual awareness, identity, ability, and memory that is the essence of oneself? If the Domain sent ships to every corner of the universe in search of hell, they would find Earth. That's great. Hello. And thank you for watching the video. It took a long ass time to make, so I appreciate it if you stuck through the whole thing. So I split this into two parts. That wasn't the original plan, but as I started making the first part, I started to realize how involved talking about this type of thing is. I intended to finish the whole thing when I was sitting in front of that jukebox and all that crazy cool looking stuff that i'm no longer near states away at this point while i was recording it and i got to chapter eight and i was recording for like eight hours at that point talking about all of this stuff i started to realize how daunting of a task it was going to be to record the whole book in one sitting because there's 17 chapters with that being said the last Three chapters are only a couple pages long but from chapters 9 to like 14 it's really dense it's full of a lot of stuff so I'm gonna make a whole separate video and another cool space talking about the rest of the book I promise and it won't be a two-year wait I know this is a really unusual topic again I do not have opinions or maybe I do, and I'm just not sharing them at the moment. You tell me. This whole thing is just for fun. Like I said, I found out about the book. It kind of piqued my interest because it scratches that itch of like, what if? But I just thought it would be fun to talk about because talking about video games was getting boring. And trust me, I tried making other videos. It just wasn't fitting. I would work on a script, be like, wow. I'm just not feeling it, man. Then I would pick another game to try to talk about, and it just, nothing was clicking. And in order for me to make the videos good, I need to put my fucking heart into it, and if I don't care about what I'm talking about, that's not gonna happen. And I don't wanna make shitty videos. So it took a while, but I finally made one. Uh, thank you for watching. Let me know your opinion on all of this stuff in the comments, and also give me some criticism. Tell me I'm fucking dumb as shit or whatever, and I will take that criticism and use it for the next video to make it better. Because I already have everything written down. I just, it's just a matter of setting up the camera when I have the time and talking in front of it like I'm doing now. Thank you for watching. And if you... Thank you for watching. And if you liked this video, make sure you like it, please. Uh, this video was a lot of work. And if you want, please subscribe. I am very close to getting a million subscribers, so please, just trying to make it to that milestone. So if you could help me out and subscribe to the video, share it around to anybody you think is interested in this subject, because I fucking love this shit. Uh, to me, all this is very fascinating. That's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for watching, and until we meet again, goodbye. You have anything to say? Hmm? Did you? You got anything to say? Goodbye. What's up? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay. 
goodbye. <laughs>